Hey there guys, welcome to my walkthrough of the AQA November 2018 Foundation GCSE Maths Paper 1. Now, if you're watching these before the June 2019 exams and you want to see papers 2 and 3, be sure to give this video some love with a comment, thumbs up and get subscribed. If you're watching this after June 2019, do those things anyway, because you're awesome. Down in the description, you'll find lots of useful stuff, including my playlist with every AQA paper walkthrough, very useful, as well as useful bits and bobs for your GCSE Maths revision. Be sure to check it out. Okay, paper one, let's go. Okay, question 1 wants us to work out minus 3 and minus 8. So, minus 3 and minus 8 is minus 3 minus 8. So, on a number line, we are starting at minus 3. Let's put a 0 there. Now, we are subtracting another 8. Subtractions take you left. So that's going to take us 8 places further into negative land. That's going to take us to minus 11. Question 2. What does the longest bar on a bar chart represent. So the longest bar here represents the thing with the highest frequency or the most common thing that is the mode. Question 3. Work out 1.1 minus 0 0.15. Okay. So Given that 0 0.15 has two decimal places, we're going to make 1.1 also have two decimal places. So 1.1 is 1.10 minus 0 0.15. Starting on the right, we can't do 0, take 5. So we borrow this 1. Now we got 10 take 5 is 5. Now we can't do 0 take 1. So we borrow this one. So now we got 10 take 1. Uh, which is 9. Then we got 0 take 0. We get 0 0.95. Question 3. Four. On a circle, which of these is always longer than the diameter? Circle, your answer. Okay. So, on a circle, the diameter is the line that goes from one side of the circle through the centre to the other. So, it's always snow gone amazingly. Yeah. So, something like that. Now, a chord, which is our first guy, is a straight line from circumference to circumference, but not through the middle. So that's not the guy. An arc is a piece of the circumference. So that could be longer, or it could be shorter. So that's not always true. Radius is a line from the centre to the outside 
Now, circumference is the distance around the outside that is always longer than the diameter. Cool. Okay, question 5 wants us to work out 83 times 26. So the way that I would recommend is the lattice method. If you've never seen it before, it's worth checking out. Okay, so we put 8, 3, 2, 6. Okay, so each square has a multiplication between the thing on the top and the thing on the side. So 2 times 3 is 6. When you get a single digit number, you put a 0 in the top left. Ah, 2 times 8 is 16. Uh, 6 times 3 is 18. And 6 times 8 is 48. Now starting from the bottom right we now add up along these diagonals. So we always start bottom right. So this is just going to be the 8. Then we got 6, add 1, add 8, which is 15. So we put 5 there carry the one up to the next diagonal. So now we got one, add zero, add six, add four, which is eleven. Put the one there, carry the one up, and then one add one is two. So our answer is two thousand one hundred and fifty-eight. Cool. Question 6 tells us the cost of 3 calendars is £18. Work out the cost of 5 calendars. Okay, so if we call a calendar C, we know that 3C is equal to £18. To work out the cost of one calendar, we divide by three. So one calendar is six pounds. So five calendars is five times six pounds, which is 30 pounds. Cool. Question seven. The Halakot played uh, does 3,206 full turns in 7 minutes. Work out the number of full turns per minute. Okay, so this is division. If you're not happy with the bus stop before paper 1, please sort it out because you're going to need it and it's not that difficult. So, we want to do 3,206 divided by 7. So, working from left to right, division is the only one where we do this. There always has to be one awkward guy. 7 doesn't go into 3, so we put a 0 up above. Carry the 3. 7's into 32 go 4 times. We got 7, 14, 21, 
28. So we got four up there. Now our remainder is also four. Sevens into 40 go five times. Do it uh, there, which is 35. So we got five there, remainder five. Sevens and 56 go eight times. So the answer is 458. Cool. Okay, question 8. So, at a cinema, films are shown on screen 1 and screen 2. Just like my local cinema, which is pretty much a shed. So, customers pay full price or child price. There are three times as many customers in screen 2 as screen 1. Uh, we are told 68 customers paid full price. We want to complete the frequency tree. 5 marks. Okay. So, we know that there are 87 people in screen 1. We were told that uh, there are three times as many customers in screen 2 as in screen 1. So, customers in screen 2 is three times 87. Now for that, we can use the old lattice again if you want. So we've got three there, eight there, seven there, so 3 times 7 is 21, 3 times 8 is 24, so then we go 1, 2 and 4 is 6, and then the 2 rounds out, so that's 261. So that's the amount of customers in screen 2. So Screen 2 must have something awesome like the Avengers on. Screen 1 probably has something rubbish. Alright, from this, we can work out the total number of customers at the cinema. And that is going to go in this bubble here. So to do that, we do the ones in screen 1 and the ones in screen 2. Two. So, total customers is 87 and 261. So, I'm going to do that this way around. Starting from the right, 1 and 7 is 8. 6 and 8 is 14, 4 there, carry the 1, 2 and 1 is 3. So there are 348 customers altogether. Okay, now, we were told that, actually, hang on, what we can do here, is work out the number of people that paid full price in screen 1. We know these two numbers here have to add together to 87. So 87 take 15 is 72. 
So 72 people paid full price in screen one. Okay, now we were told. Uh, 68 customers paid child price. So we know there's 15 who have paid child price there. So to work out how many go here, we do 68 minus 15, which is 53. So 53 people in screen 2 paid child price. Now we can work out how many paid full price by doing 261 minus 53. So we can't do 1 take 3, borrow 1 from the 6, 11 take 3 is 8, 5 take 5 is uh, 0, and then the 2 just falls down. So we got 208 people that have paid full price in screen 2. There is our completed frequency tree. Cool. Question 9 wants us to uh, work out the fraction that is halfway between one half and one and a quarter. Okay. So, three marks, so quite tricky. Let's first of all turn one and a quarter into an improper fraction. So one and one quarter. To do this, we do the bottom of the fraction times the whole number. So four times one. Add the top of the fraction all over to the bottom. So that's five quarters. Now, we know then that that, if this line is broken into four parts is here. Now we know that one half is here. Now I'm going to write one half in terms of quarters. So one half is two quarters. Now the distance between them is five quarters minus two quarters is three quarters. So the distance between here and there is three quarters old colour. Now we know then, we know that we can see from the line that the number halfway between them is going to be here. Now that is going to be halfway between them, so it's going to be half of three quarters uh, away from each number. So, we know that uh, this point here would be three quarters, and we know this point here is one, which is four quarters. So, what's halfway between three quarters and four quarters, well, it would be 3.5 quarters, but we would never want a decimal in a fraction. So we need to turn 
3.5 into a whole number, which we can do by multiplying the top and bottom by 2. So 2 times 3.5 is 7 and 2 times 4 is 8 so it's 7 eighths ok question 10 x is a positive integer integer means whole number uh, positive means greater than 0 35 divided by x is a positive integer. So when we divide 35 by x, which is a whole number, we get a whole number answer. We want to work out the four possible values of x. So if you divide a number by an integer, so by again a whole number and you get a whole number for your answer, that means the number that you are dividing by is a factor of the number. So essentially all that this is asking for is the factors of 35. So we got 1, 5, 7, and 35. So for example, if x is 7, 35 divided by 7 gives us 5. 35 divided by 1 gives us 35. 35 divided by 35 gives us 1. Cool. Okay, question 11. Fair dice has six sides numbered 1, 2, 6. After it is rolled, five of the numbers can be seen. Write down a... Write down the probability that one of these five numbers is 2. Okay, so... We can see five out of the six numbers. When you roll a dice, one number is going to be face down. So we can't see that one. Now, two only pops up once out of the six times. So the probability that we can't see two is one sixth. So the probability that we can see 2 is 5 sixths. Part B wants us to work out the greatest possible sum of the 5 numbers. So sum means to add together. So if we want to get the greatest possible sum, we want to be able to see the five biggest numbers. So that's going to be 2 add 3 add 4 add 5 add 6. So that's going to give us 20. Cool. Okay, question 12 wants us to work out uh, 2 sevenths and 6 sevenths. So when fractions have the same number on the bottom, we just add or subtract across the top. So this is going to give us 8 over 7. Now if we look at the answers, That's not there, so we're going to want to turn this into a mixed number. So, how many sevens are there in 8? There is 1. 
and the remainder is 1. So we get 1 and 1 seventh. Cool. Question 13. Work out 4 add 3 times 5 minus 1. So remember, you can't always just work left to right. We have to do things in a certain order. So here, we have to do 3 times 5 first. So we get 4 add 15 minus 1. 4 add 15 is 19, minus 1 is 18. Bit maths. Cool. Question 14. The nth term of a sequence is 5n minus 2. Work out the third term. Okay, so n is the term number of the sequence. So for the third term, n is equal to 3. So we get 5 times 3 minus 2. 5 times 3 is 15, minus 2 is 13. So I'll put my sequences stuff down below in the description. Okay, question 15, we have some angle fun. So trapezium A, B, C, E is made up from parallelogram uh, A, B, C, D and isosceles triangle A, D, E. We're told that A, E is equal to D, E. So that's just these two lines here. That's what these little dashes mean. Um, we want to work out the size of angle A, E, D. So, angle A, E, D is the angle made by going from point A to point E to point D. So, we want this chap here. Now then, we know this guy is an isosceles triangle, so that's important. That means that this angle is equal to this angle. Okay, now we know this angle over here is 110. Now, in a parallelogram, opposite angles are equal. So, this angle here is also 110. Again, because opposite angles in a parallelogram are equal. Okay, now we've got these two angles which are sitting on a straight line. Angles on a straight line add up to 180. So that means this angle here has to be 70. Now, in this triangle, we know these two angles are the same. So that is also 70. Now, angles in a triangle add up to 180. 70 add 70 is 140. So the angle that we need must be 40 degrees. Cool. Okay, question 15. 8B is 1, 2, 6. 8C is 3 to 1. How many times bigger is B than A? Okay, how many marks is that? Two. Okay, so 
what I'm going to do for this is combine the ratios. I've got a video on this, so I'll put this down below. So we know that A to B is 1 to 6. And we know A to C is 3 to 1. So imagine A, B and C are apples, bananas and coconuts. The first ratio tells us that for every one apple we have six bananas and the second ratio tells us for every three apples we have one coconut. So we want to know how many times bigger is B than C. So what we're going to do is turn the A part of each ratio into the same number. So the first number that 1 and 3 go into are is 3. So we can say this ratio on the left is 3 to 18. Now what we can say from that is that A to B to C is 3 to 18 to 1. Now in terms of B and C, so where that's come from is that I now know for every three apples I have, I have 18 bananas and for every three apples I have, I have one coconut. So from that, we can say the ratio B to C is just 18 to 1. So B is 18 times bigger than C. Okay, 17. Laura wants to work out 3% of 1,700. Her method is 1,700 times 0 0.3. Is her method correct? Tick a box. Her method is not correct. 0 0.3 is 30%. So she would find 30% of 1,700. So now, now what she should have done, she should be 0 0.03 times 1,700. Part B, Laura, also wants to work out 30 29ths of 60. So 30 29ths is a top heavy fraction. That means we are going to get an answer bigger than 60. Her answer is 58. Oh dear. Is her answer correct? Well, again, no. Uh, so, let's see what she has done here. What she's done... She's found 29 30ths. Let's prove it. So, 1 30th is 60 divided by 30. which is 2 and then 29 thirtieths is 29 times 2 which is 58. So that's what she's done. So she's done it the wrong way around. 
say we could say she's found um twenty nine thirtieths not thirty twenty ninths. Uh, you could also just say that the answer should have been bigger than sixty because it was an improper fraction, something like that, and you're cool. Okay, question 18. Here are five shapes A to E. So, shape A is a parallelogram, B, a regular pentagon, C, rhombus, D, a scaling triangle, and E, trapezium. In the Venn diagram, our set so this little squiggle, that just means our whole set. It's nothing scary. It's actually the Greek letter Epsilon, but you don't need to know that. So our whole set is the set of all the shapes. So shapes A, B, C, D, E. What that means is all of our shapes need a place in the Venn diagram. Now Q is the set of quadrilaterals, which are the shapes with four sides, and set R is the set of shapes which always have a rotational symmetry. So rotational symmetry is when you rotate a shape and it looks exactly the same as it did before you rotated it. So, for example, if we had the shape, uh, if we had a parallelogram, let's say we rotated it 90 degrees, uh, clockwise, then it would look like that. So that doesn't look the same as it did when we started. But then if we rotated it again, another 90 degrees, it would look like that. So if we rotate it 180 degrees, it looks the same as I did at the start. So it does have a rotational symmetry. So, here's our Venn diagram. Good times. We want to complete the Venn diagram uh, with the letters A to E. Okay, so only quadrilaterals go here. Quadrilaterals with rotational symmetry go here. Shapes that are not quadrilaterals but have rotational symmetry go here. Shapes that are neither quadrilateral or have rotational symmetry go on the outside. Okay, so shape a then is a parallelogram. Well, we've just shown that that does have rotational symmetry and it's four-sided shape. So that goes there. B, a regular pentagon. So pentagons have five sides. A regular one means all sides are the same. So does this guy have rotational symmetry? Yes. If we just pushed it over either to the left or to the right, not only are we bullying a pentagon, but it's going to look exactly the same. So it's not a quadrilateral, but it has rotational symmetry. C, a rhombus. So a rhombus is a squat 
square so it's essentially a parallelogram except all the sides are the same so does this guy have rotational symmetry? yes and it's quadrilateral so C goes in the middle D a scalene triangle so a scalene triangle is a triangle where nothing is equal so it's not a quadrilateral and it's not going to have any rotational symmetry so that goes on the outside and then E a trapezium trapeziums look like this or you can have a trapezium with a vertical side either way though there's no rotational symmetry but they are quadrilaterals so E goes in there cool Okay, number 19, A is 7 and B is 2. Work out the value of A over B minus A to the B. Okay, so if A is 7 and B is 2, we get uh, 7 over 2 minus... 7 squared now 7 over 2 is 3.5 now by bit mass we do the power first so 7 squared is 49 so we got 3.5 minus 49 okay so now we need to work this out. So I'm going to think of this instead as minus 49 add 3.5. Perfectly fine to do that. Now on a number line then, put a zero there, minus 49 can be down here. So we want to add on 3.5. So let's First of all, add 3. So additions take us right. So that's going to get us up to minus 46. And then we want to add on 0 0.5. So that's going to give us minus 45.5. Cool. Question 20, 1 says 2, solve, 3x minus 8 is equal to 19. So, solve means to get x on its own. First thing we need to do is add the 8. So I've got, I think, a whole playlist on solving equations, so I'll put this down below. So, we add 8. We get 3x is equal to 27. Now 3x means 3 times x. So to cancel out the 3, we divide both sides by 3. So we get x is 27 over 3, which is 9. Cool. Okay, 21. Here are five number cards. True story. Uh, two of the five cards are picked at random. Work out the probability that the total of the two numbers is more than 30. Okay, three marks. Right. So for this, they have given us a lot of room. That screams at us then to make a table. So 
So here we got 17, 12, 23, 15, and 16. Now we put the same numbers down the side, so 17, 12, 23, 15, 16. Okay, so we know that we can't pick the same card twice. So we can't get 17 and 17, can't get 12 and 12, can't get 23 and 23, can't get 15 and 15. And can't get 16 and 16. Okay, so can get 17 and 12. Change color. So 17 and 12 is 19. 17 and 23 is 40. So remember, we want any answers bigger than 30. So I'm going to circle the ones that we want. 17 and 15 is 32. We want that. 17 and 16 is 33. So we want that. Okay, the next row. 12 and 17 is 29. 12 add 23 is 35, we want that. 12 add 15 is 27. 12 add 16 is 18. Next row, 23 add 17 is 40, so we want that. 23 add 12 is 35, we want that. Uh, 23 add 15 is a number. 38, we want that. 23 add 16 is um, 39, we want that. 15 add 17 is 32, and we want that. 15 add 12 is 27. 15 add 23 is 38, we want that. 15 add 16 is 31, we want that. Alright, final row. Pretty hell. 16 add 17 is 33. Yes, please. 16 add 12, 28. No thanks. 16 add 23 is 39. Yes, please. And then finally, 16 and 15 is 31. Which we want. Alright, so now we want the probability that a number is over 30. So, how many have we got? We are 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So, we got 14. Out of how many possible outcomes? Um, we get 20 possible outcomes. It says 14 out of 20, or 7 out of 10. Cool. 
Okay, question 22, we got a graph, so about it, complete the table of values for y equals x squared. So, whenever you square anything, you get a positive answer. So, minus 2 squared is 4. Minus 1 squared is 1. 0 squared is 0. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. Part B. Uh, draw the graph of y equals x squared for values of x from minus 2 to 2. So we need to plot these points. So remember, x is along, y is up or down. So the first point we need is minus 2, 4. So there's minus 2. And then 4 is there. Then we have minus 1, 1, which is there. 0, 0, which is there. 1, 1, which is there. And then 2, 4, which is there. Now, I'll never join these up with a ruler. It's a curve, so freehand it. Now this probably won't go very well, but let's have a go. Okay, here we'll do. Cool. Okay, and then part C. One says to use our graph to estimate the value of a root 2.6. So, this is not at all obvious. So we know that the equation that we've just plotted is y is equal to x squared. From that we can square root both sides and get root y is equal to x. So if we want root 2.6 then what we're going to do is go across from 2.6 on the y-axis until we hit the curve. So we're going to go across and then we're going to go straight down to the x-axis. Now the x value that we get is our estimate. So that's going to be about 1.6 pens a bit thick. Oops. So it's going to be 1.6. Cool. Okay, 23. Two consecutive whole numbers are n and n plus 1. So consecutive means one after the other. So, for example, 7 and 8, 10 and 11, 103 and 104. Part A, 1 says 2, simplify, n minus n add 1. So, when you have a minus on the outside of a bracket, it essentially means minus 1 times everything inside. So we got n. Now minus 1 times n is minus 1. No it's not, it's minus n. And minus 1 times 1 is minus 1. So we've got n minus n, which cancels out minus 1. So we just get minus one, go. Part B, multiply out n times n plus one. Okay, so what this means then is the thing on the outside multiplies both things on the inside. So n times n is n squared, n times 1 is 1 
N. So we get N squared add N. Cool. Part C. The two numbers are added. Show that the answer must be an odd number. Okay, so what we're doing then is N add N add 1. Now that's going to give us 2N add 1. Now, remember that N is a whole number. Now, if you multiply a whole number by 2, you are always going to get an even answer. So we know that 2N is always even. Now, we know that an even number or one more than an even number is odd. So 2N is even, we're adding 1 to it, so it's 1 more than 2N, 1 more than an even number, so it's odd. Boom. Okay, 24. Bit of a stupid one to see on the foundation paper. We are now at the questions that are also on the higher. So this first one is exact trig values. At foundation, I would say there's absolutely no reason why you should know this. So we want the value of cos of 30. So as it goes, it's root 3 over 2. But as I say, why is this here? Don't worry about it too much. Okay, 25. Work out 8 and a half divided by two and two thirds. Okay, so how many marks is this? Four, yeah, good. Okay, so whenever you're doing any sort of arithmetic with mixed numbers, you first of all want to turn them into um, improper fractions. So, uh, 8 and 1 half. Okay, so remember we do the bottom times the whole number. So, 2 times 8 at the top, all over the bottom. So that's going to give us 17 halves. 2 and 2 thirds. Well, we're going to do 3 times 2, add 2 over 3. So that's going to give us 8 thirds. Okay, so our question is now 17 halves divided by 8 thirds. So, to divide by a fraction, we flip it over and multiply by it. So this is going to be 17 halves times 3 over 8. Now when you're multiplying fractions, you multiply across the top and across the bottom. So. 17 times 3, well, 3 times 10 is 30, 3 times 20, well, there, 3 times 7 is 21, so altogether that's 51 over uh, 2 times 8, which is 16. So that is the answer, but they want it as a mixed number. So, a little bit cruel because it's 16s. How many 16s are there in 51? Well, we've got 16, 32, 48. So, we can say this is 
48 sixteenths and 3 sixteenths. 48 sixteenths is 3, so we got 3 and 3 sixteenths. Pow. Okay, question 20 something, 26. A ship is sailing in a straight line from its home port. The distance time graph shows four hours of this journey. So we got distance from port outside in miles, time in hours along the bottom. We want to work out the speed of the ship during the four hours. Okay, first thing to notice is the graph is a straight line, which means constant speed. Now we also know speed is distance over time. Now we know here, over this whole part of the graph, the time was 4 hours. So what we need to work out is the distance travelled over these 4 hours. So, at the beginning, first of all we need to get ourselves happy with the scale. So one big square represents 20, there's five little squares between, so each little square is four. So at the start of the graph, the distance from port is 48 miles. Now at the other point, at the end, four hours later, we are now 116 miles from port. So we need to work out the distance travelled. So we need to do 116 minus 48. So can't do 68. So we're going to steal 1. 16 take 8 is 8. And then essentially now we're just doing 10 take 4, which is 6. So in the four hours, it's gone 68 miles. So the speed then is 68 over 4. We can use the bus stop for that. So 4 into 6 goes once, remainder 2. 4 into 28 goes 7 times. So the speed is 17 miles per hour. Cool. K27. Kim works at an airport in the UK. She records the number of planes landing uh, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. The table shows data for the first 10 days in January. Part A tells us the airport was affected by fog on one of these days. Which day do you think it was? Give a reason for your answer. So, thinking logically, fog is going to make it harder for planes to land, so less planes would be landing. So, are any of these numbers a lot lower than the rest? Day 8 looks like a winner. So in day 8, and we would say uh, far fewer planes landing than other days. Cool. Okay, part B. Uh, oh, this one. Alright, okay. Uh, Kim uses this data to predict how many planes will land at the airport in a, a year. In her uh, method, 
she uses an estimate of 150 planes in each four hour period throughout the day and the, she assumes the same number of planes each day. We want to work out her prediction. Okay, so she is assuming 150 planes land every four hours. So the first thing we need to work out is how many four hour periods are there in one day. So in a day, there are 24 hours. So 24 hours divided by 4 hours gives us 6. So there are 6 4 hour periods in one day. So the total planes per day is going to be 6 times 150. So 6 times 100 is 600. 6 times 50 is 300. So that's going to give us 900 planes a day. Now, there are 365 days in a year. So the total per year is going to be 365 times 900. Now, I'm going to break this multiplication up. We can think of 900 as 9 times 100. So we could, first of all, do 365 times 9 and then multiply that by 100. So we can use the old lattice method. So three, six, five, nine. So nine times five is forty five. Nine times six, fifty four. Nine times three, twenty seven. So working from the bottom right, the five falls out. There we go. 4 at 4 is 8. And then we got 5 at 7 is 12. So 2 there. Carry the 1. So 1 add 2 is 3. So we then need to do 3,285 times 100. For which we just smash two zeros on the end. So we get 328,500. Boom. Okay, then for part C, we are told, in fact, fewer planes land in winter than in summer. Fewer planes land at night than during the day. What does this tell you about Kim's prediction? Okay, so the data in the table was from January, which is winter, and the data were from times between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So we are in the winter when fewer planes land, but we are during the day when more planes land than at night. So, 
All that we know then is that our prediction could be too low or too high. And the reason is that the data is from daytime during winter and data or the amount of planes varies with season and time of day. Cool. Okay, 28. The sum of the angles in any quadrilateral is 360 degrees. True story. For example, in a rectangle, 4 times 90 is 360. Zach says 5 times 90 is 450. So the sum of the angles in any pentagon is 450. Is that correct? Show working uh, to support your answer. Okay, that is not correct. The reason that angles in any quadrilateral add up to 360 is because corner to corner we can split it into two triangles, angles in triangles add up to 180. In a pentagon, if we do the same thing, we can make three triangles. So, three times 180 is 540 degrees. So, Zach is our wrong. Okay, 29. So, just to put you in the picture, every higher person I've done this with has hated this question too. So, it looks a lot scarier than it actually is. So we got the square root of a 6 squared and 8 squared is equal to the cube root of 125a cubed. Work out the value of A. Okay, so let's just sort out the left hand side. So the square root, oh sorry, this, there. 6 squared is 36. 8 squared is 64. 36 add 64 is 100. The square root of a hundred is ten. So now we got ten is equal to the cube root of a hundred and twenty-five a cubed. Now on the right, because a hundred and twenty-five is multiplying the a cubed, so it's not adding like the six squared and the eight squared away. We can cube root both numbers. So the cube root of um, 125 is 5 because 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. So we got 5 and then the cube root of a cubed is a. So we got 10 is equal to 5a. We need to get rid of the 5. 5a means 5 times a. So divide through by 5. We get 2 is equal to a. Cool. 
costing the 30 on 13 work out the percentage increase from 80 to 280. Okay, so another very tricky one. So, to work out a percentage increase, we first of all need to work out the number increase. So, the increase is 280 minus 80, which is 200. So what we now need to know is what is 200 as a percentage of 80. So, 80 is 100% of 80. We can add another 80. 160 is 200% of 80. Now, to get to 200, we need to add 40. Now, 40 is 50% of 80. So, 200 then is 250% of 80. So, it's a 250% increase. Cool. Okay, question 31, grand finale, we want to solve x squared minus x minus 12 is equal to 0. So this is a quadratic equation, I'll put my quadratic stuff down below. So to solve these guys, we need to factorise them, which means to put them into brackets. Now quadratics usually have two pairs of brackets, each one has an x. Now, also inside each bracket goes a number either being added or subtracted. Uh, so, the rules are the two numbers multiply together to minus 12 and add Minus x means minus 1x. So because we need them to multiply to a negative number, that tells us one number is positive and the other is negative. Now numbers that multiply to 12 are 1 and 12. We need these numbers to have a difference of 1. So 1 and 12, no good. 2 and 6, no good. 3 and 4, bingo. So to get a minus in the middle, we need minus 4 and 3. Now, to get the solutions of x, the signs of the numbers flip. So x is actually minus 3 and positive 4. Cool. Okay, with that guys, paper done. Remember, if you're watching this before GCSE Maths 2019, give us a thumbs up, drop a comment, get subscribed if you want to see papers 2 and 3. Good luck in your exam guys, uh, take it easy. Take care.